This is just the beginning. That's the world that we live in. Let me help you believe in what we can do when we stand united. We are one. We're the world. We can make a brighter tomorrow. Together, make a change. It's our life. We can step back from what we know is right. So let's shine our light. Oh, let's shine our light. We won't listen to what they're saying. We know. It's just love that we're giving to this place that we call our home. We can't change what's been done, but it's still our run. We are one, one with the world. We can make a brighter tomorrow together. Make a change. Change. It's a lie. Step back from what we know is right. So let's shine our light. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Catalyze and Change Week 2024. We're really excited about this session. And thanks to Ali's incredible support to Catalyst 2030, this is happening. We This session is on how we can embed people-powered solutions at the World Bank. For those of you who don't know about Catalyzing Change Week, it's the world's largest social innovator. Wow. Led, um, Are we still on? Buddy, I would request you to mute if you aren't speaking so we don't disturb the speakers. Mm -hmm. Um. And we have over a hundred sessions happening in the in this in the course of this week. So if this is the only session that you've signed up for. Please be sure to sign up to the rest. Another thing I'm going to be putting in the chat is we have developed a new AI tool for the sector so that we can encourage maximum collaboration and co-creation from the group. So I'll put the link in the chat and please be sure to test it out and let us know your feedback and if there were any bugs that you found with it. With that, I will uh, pass over to Sheila, who will take us through the session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mishri. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sheila Patel. I live in Mumbai, and I run an organization called, called Spark, and I am a recent member of Catalyst 2030. My focus right now is to work on the issues of development and climate change. And I was privileged to be part of a group of Catalyst members who got together in Bellagio late last year to start thinking about the role and contribution that Catalyst members could take on in blending the challenges of development and climate and to explore ways by which the evidence-based innovations that they represented as aggregators of large volumes of community members from different parts of the world get a seat at the table to discuss, make representations, and to be a partner rather than a beneficiary or a supplicant recipient of assistance. So along with Helmi from Egypt and myself, we were nominated to chair co-chair the group in which we have two names for ourselves. One is called uh, Catalysts for Climate and the other one, which is more important to all of us is to say, how do all of us who are members of Catalyst, and she just said that we are one of the largest networks, how do we learn to share knowledge, to expand the repertoire of 
who we reach out to, and to build within the climate space an acknowledgement of the value contribution and the gravitas to bring innovators and entrepreneurs in this sector very centrally into the challenge of reaching resources, knowledge, finances to the those vulnerable communities in whose name so much investment is made, but for whom this resource does not come through. And so here we are, hoping to explore new grounds in the climate space, to become centrally opinion makers, demonstrators of scalable solutions, aggregating evidence of impact and outcomes and a placeholder in discussions that are global, regional, national, and local on issues that address the challenges that very poor and vulnerable communities face across the world. We were very privileged to have Ali from the World Bank at the Bellagio meeting. And we agreed that global institutions need to explore new paradigms to examine how delivery of resources doesn't become a top-down, one-way street, but becomes a mechanism by which everybody involved in this process sits across the table and begins to explore ways to produce delivery mechanisms that share risks, share resources, share knowledge, and produce evidence-based solutions that then national governments can take on. Global finance has to produce game-changing solution strategies based on science, based on evidence and based on a demonstrated impact on the lives of people in order for this to be adopted by cities, urban and rural institutional arrangements, national governments, and so on. So it gives me great pleasure to invite Ali to make a presentation of what he is striving to do and we want to make a commitment that all of us who are part of Catalysts for Climate are there to assist and support you in examining this process. So over to you, Ali. Thank you so much, Sheila, for the, uh, the, the warm introduction. And it's always a pleasure to uh, be with uh, friends at Catalyst. Um, thanks to Jeru and Bill Morian, the whole team who's put together the session today. And uh, it's been um, sort of a real privilege to start to co-create this with you and many others who are you know, key drivers of this space across the world. So um, like I was introduced, I'm Ali Rahim. I had the Global Partnership for Social Accountability at the World Bank and I'm the Global Lead for Citizen Engagement at the World Bank. And the GPSA was uh, was created at the uh, the World Bank about twelve years ago. Um, let's go ahead and press the slides. Sorry, just trying to get. Oh, there we go. So, if you see the pathway here, um, you know the World Bank is primarily, of course, a lender to sovereign states. Um, but we have been trying as an institution to understand how we can better reach and elevate uh, solutions coming out of the social sector, which are quite relevant to the development finance we provide primarily to governments. And this is a legacy that goes back more than 40 years when the World Bank created its first NGO World Bank Committee. Some of you may have been involved in the sort of path-breaking development marketplace in the early 90s and 2000s, uh, which created a, a global forum and financing mechanism to identify solutions coming out of the social sector, which could make a tangible impact on how we do finance development and bring more organizations into partnership with the World Bank. Um, 
And then the Global Partnership for Social Accountability that I lead was created after the Arab Spring when the president of the World Bank at the time had an ambition to create a standing uh, dedicated financing facility to bring civil society uh, into the bank's delivery and to really leverage civil society for uh, looking at how to make development delivery more effective, how to enhance quality, how to bring citizen oversight more directly into uh, the process of how we deliver development. And now we're at an interesting nexus where the evolution of the international financial system is underway. There's an evolution of the World Bank that its shareholders are leading, its G20 priority. And a lot of it you know, is centered around climate finance and our global challenges and making the multilateral development bank, starting with the World Bank, more fit for purpose to drive much larger volumes of financing and set the standards for how we tackle and finance these global challenges. And I think that's where today's discussion really picks off. The GPSA, as we know it, will close, and we have uh, committed to creating a new institution to better support um, our collaboration with uh, social sector actors. So where we've been is we've you know, looked at how we bring our convening power to bear and how we can be an enabler in these spaces. I think there's a very powerful innovation ecosystem uh, there's funders and there's other collaboratives that are supporting organizations like yours to bring solutions to a certain scale, but there isn't a bridge to the broader architecture that is part of the formal financing system. And as we're trying to renew that, our idea is here, how do we create a bridge? How do we create uh, a set of uh, uh, financing and convening modalities that allow us to really bridge these two ecosystems? And then how do we provide financing in a more flexible, adaptable, nimble way that really prioritizes locally led solution, locally owned solution, and bringing those people powered solutions more directly into the delivery model of the MDBs, starting with the World Bank. So one thing we did this year is the last financing under our current platform, we launched the Green Accountability Global Initiative. We were looking at the climate finance space and looking at the critical importance of transparency, participation, accountability, grounding climate solutions in local communities, in citizen-led efforts, and also ensuring the quality of the overall financing and delivery, ensuring that voices could be channeled into national level decision-making processes, and then that cascaded down to what's happening at local communities. So one thing we wanted to do was get out of the fragmented grant-making that we were perhaps uh, also engaged in, and focus more on scaled models for convening knowledge and financing. So with this, we launched a, a global platform, and we wanted to push out decision-making to networks, networks that could reach many different kinds of organizations at many different levels. So what we're proposing with this is a vertically integrated uh, model where we can support civil society at the local level. We can help build national systems collaboratively with government. We can help channel then those, um, the knowledge from those activities into more global decision making. What we found is often these different strata of the ecosystem are not well connected. So, uh, and then we wanted a more flexible, adaptable way of driving financing out that wasn't constrained, one, by the transaction costs of managing these individual World Bank projects under World Bank standards, which are really designed for much larger volumes of lending to countries, um, uh, and then relying on the networks that our partners like Catalyst and others would have. So this global platform is run by a consortium of partners, including the World Resources Institute, which is a leading global climate entity, uh, the Huayru Commission, which many of you may know is a southern uh, network of CSOs, primarily women-led across the global south, and South-South-North, which is a leading civil society capacity building uh, platform for climate, uh, also based uh, in the south, out, out of South Africa. We have adjacent um, youth initiatives and technology accelerators to help also with the kind of enabling that we would need to do this reach. This is being piloted in five countries, um, Senegal, Bangladesh, Cameroon, Mexico, and Brazil, all of which had different aspects of the climate challenge. And it's being harmonized with overall World Bank engagement in those countries and in dialogue with the governments, ministries of finance and others to see how we can systematically bring social sector actors into the oversight of climate finance and action and really bring the voices of people to bear and how decisions are made, how resources are allocated and the monitoring and oversight of delivery. So it also serves as a proof of concept of how we wanna move forward 
uh, with the new facility that's looking really on scaling and accelerating solutions that are emerging out of civil society. We want to look at the social innovation networks that exist both globally, but all the way down in local countries and local communities, and to see in an aggregated way, what are the network solutions that are on offer that we can draw on to help achieve some of the larger development goals the World Bank is pursuing. So of course we have this model on climate, and it's also the model we want to uh, work on as we move towards our, our new facility, our new alliance. So I think for our initial uh, program, we were really focused on um, social accountability as an enabler. I think what we see now is that there are many roles that civil society and social innovators play in ensuring that this, the activities undertaken traditionally by government in the private sector are enhanced by a broader reach. There's the role of innovators in developing solutions that are grounded in the realities that exist in local communities. There are implementation uh, uh, value and comparative advantages that social sector organizations have, which I don't really need to explain to this group, but especially for the last mile, especially in reaching the vulnerable, especially in setting interventions in local contexts and local knowledge and local culture. Um, there's an oversight function that the original social accountability role played. Uh, and then there's a brokering uh, function that's very important to build the kind of social license and collective participation, collective action strategies that we need to achieve success. Now, again, the challenge is that I think the social innovation sector and the civil society sector is, is very good at taking things to a certain scale. But then when there's no integration or no crosstalk with official government financing or with larger scale investments coming from organizations like the World Bank, often these innovations only scale to a certain uh, level and then can't be integrated into larger delivery models. So that's really the thinking of this new facility is what can we do to bridge? Civic is really intended as a bridge between these two worlds. So the real objective of the new facility is to build out these thematic platforms. Initially, we're talking about four priority areas, but we are open and, and intend to expand this into any number of areas where we're really building these platforms that work all the way from the local level up to the global level. They serve to allow for convening, financing, and knowledge in an in integrated platform. And what we want to do is also play to the comparative advantage of the World Bank and our comparative advantage is helping scale, helping take initiatives that have been incubated by other actors and scaling them into this larger financing ecosystem. And then the knowledge aspect is very important. I think one thing that's often lacking, especially as we move into to setting new global priorities, setting new policy standards, is how we truly reflect the voice and aggregate, the perspectives and aggregate emerging out of civil society and social innovation networks that can really inform how we structure the larger scale financing. So that knowledge nexus that we've built one on top of the, the green accountability initiative becomes increasingly important. So as you see from this model and, and what, we, what I articulated earlier is we wanna build out these pillars around climate, gender, youth, health, and, and hopefully other platforms as well. So we can have these standing platforms that are linked to the World Bank and hopefully to other IFIs as well to bring in the scaled solutions that could be connected to how we deliver our business so that we can bring those that knowledge in, in through these global consortiums that involve large scale networks. That we wanna rely on networks that our goal isn't to have grant making secretariats based at World Bank headquarters, making grant making decisions to individual CSOs, but we're empowering networks that connect to convene the right actors, to provide financing, to help us link them to the larger scale programs the World Bank will be financing and working on with government. So there is, there is effort to also support the kind of policy change, the policy dialogue, legislative change, different things we often do support through our development policy dialogue, through development policy lending with governments that could enable and help scale the sector. So again, all this will work if we're connecting this to the major instruments the World Bank has, that we're using the bridge financing we provide to then embed commitments in World Bank country partnership frameworks about the kind of systemic changes needed to ensure that social sector actors are integrated both into planning, prioritization, and delivery of major development efforts, that we reflect this in our development reports, that we reflect this in our 
individual investment programs and sector specific uh, lending strategies in countries. So this really serves uh, its intention is to serve as a bridge to influence larger uh, volumes of financing that would come from the World Bank. So to give an example, the real goal here is to be an ecosystem enabler and to provide the connective tissue between efforts that are coming out of networks like Catalyst 2030 and the large scale, larger scale investments that are coming up from the World Bank. To make this concrete as an example, I pulled out an interesting social innovation in the circular economy. And I think the circular economy is an interesting space where a lot of these efforts could work. And the example of the work you're doing with uh, 3R Zero Waste, uh, bringing both technology enabled but citizen centered approaches to the circular economy and working uh, at scale across communities and linking that to a World Bank project that'd be working in a particular state or sometimes they're working across countries. That's strengthening formal solid waste management systems, working both with state governments and municipalities and using the facility as a bridge to bring those solutions like 3R zero waste into the actual delivery model and financing that the World Bank would traditionally support with, with government and with private sector providers in a country. So that connective tissue and bridge building will be increasingly uh, important and a way this facility will focus on leveraging and scaling some of the initiatives that are supported or incubated through networks like yours. So I think in the end of the day, you know, we want to really hear from you about how this can be an enabling facility, how building an, uh, a stronger architecture and a stronger platform in the global architecture in the World Bank can help scale and amplify the kind of efforts you're uh, undertaking. How do we link this to government work? How do we link this uh, to the large scale policy reform efforts that are needed in the country? And ultimately, how do we link this to the larger global goals and ambition we're setting? You know, one of the key things we've been saying all along is as we move down this net zero pathway on climate, as we set these targets, that if we don't involve non-state actors, if we don't involve social innovators and civil society organizations, is it really possible to get to those ambitious goals we set? As we know, systems change requires networked actors at all levels. And right now we have formal financial models for, in the international system really focused on government and the private sector. The increasingly important role of the sexual, social sector in all the countries we work in is becoming glaringly apparent to all of us. But how do we ensure the right tools are in place to, ins to bring these actors very systematically into the delivery model of the bank? So here we do need your advice. We do need your partnership. We do need to know how we would best serve the needs and ambitions and how we take advantage of the funding principles that networks like yours have established to ensure locally led solutions, community-based approaches are taken to full effect and that these are actually models that can be aggregated and scaled. I think the important point, it's not about scaling just individual organizations, it's about scaling solutions. And often those solutions are scaled through very wide networks of smaller organizations, but whether it's for climate, whether it's for gender, sexual-based violence. I met this earlier this week with Dennis Mukwege, who's the Nobel laureate um, on combating sexual violence. They're working in countries at scale, developing networks of local organizations to deliver last mile services and promote culture change to prevent sexual violence. And his main point is we can do this well, and it's actually necessary to have these networks to really get to the victims. But unless we connect to government policy, unless we connect to formal health systems, this can't be sustained and this can't be systematized. So ultimately, this is the real goal to really show that social sector actors, social innovators, civil society organizations are a core part of this larger scale delivery. And by engaging them, we affect that larger Delta, that this isn't just something that's done for purposes of inclusion, though inclusion is critical. It's really done because it's critical to the outcomes we're trying to reach. So thanks today, very excited to sort of have this uh, reflection from the group here. And, and thanks, Jeru and, and Catalyst 2030 for giving us the opportunity to engage with everyone here. Uh, uh, thank you, Ali, very much. Just stepping in uh, for Sheila just now. Uh, Sheila? 
Uh, what we would Sorry. really like, yeah, over to you. You know, Ali, you uh, you have taken a very courageous step in this process because uh, very often large global institutions are very fearful of addressing uh, the real challenges of uh, you know of of the frailty of many institutional arrangements, and so we feel that uh, you know we need new partnerships, new ways of exploring solutions. And I think that one of the things that Catalyst brings to you is an amazing ability for people who are otherwise locked in different sections, you know, circular economy, agriculture, cities, slum dwellers, this, that, and the other. For us to say, at a meta level, what can we do that brings the sum of what we do beyond what we do? And I think that exploring this process with you, interesting, much for this process. Uh, are we going into groups right now? Are we going to have some more presentations? Uh, we, my, my list is not remember, coming through. We, okay, if you remember, we were going to have Manmeet and Caroline share. Yes. Uh, Manmeet Sorry. is going to yeah. be sharing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, Manmeet, please come in. Hi, um, it's nice to be here. Um, my name is Manmeet Mehta. I work with Ashoka and we're a founding member of Catalyst 2030 um, and have worked with these challenges for about deeply about four years and examining how do you shift funding practices to better and more effectively fund systems change. And about four years ago, we launched a report um, collectively. So Schwab Foundation School, Ashoka, Echo and Green Catalyst together. And for the very first time, sort of funders and social entrepreneurs coming together to say, look, these are not just opinions, but in this research facilitated by McKinsey, that these are best practices that are actually uh, affecting the outcomes we all want. I really liked Ali, your phrase around inclusion is, is it's it's not performative it's necessary to outcomes and and so in the same way these two voices shaping this conversation um are important and and i really i, I think this is an amazing incredible initiative and i think from our conversations something that we've learned across the catalyst network and across collaborating with social entrepreneurs and funders um, one opportunity in addition to everything you've shared that this presents is really using this as a frame to redefine what is risky and how do you change the conversation around de-risking philanthropy because that is a huge factor in um, in in the gap that exists between the intention and the follow-through and commitments to systems change funding and I mean ultimately funding systems change is funding entrepreneurs who've lived the problem. There's there's many, many, many entrepreneurs in this room who probably identify with that. And, and in that you're funding people-driven and community-driven systems change. The other piece that we learned that could be interesting is um, in talk, in, in the research and in the subsequent conversations, we've learned sort of three pieces around culture, strategy, and process. And so when, whenever we're working around how do you effectively fund something, uh, we're looking at how do you build the right culture? How do you create the strategy and the process that enforce that operationalizes the culture that's been built? And, and I think that has been key in figuring out how do you sort of design the right funding vehicle and how do you design for funding more effectively? But Juru, is there anything else that you'd like me to sort of bring in from that work? Thank you. If we can move to Caroline, yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. I'm Caroline Burridge. Um, I work with an organization called TechSoup. Um, I've been asked to speak to you uh, uh, today just to bring in the, the context of or the, the, the subject of compliance uh, and the complications that come with compliance um, when it comes to community driven or locally led uh, development. And so I am, as I say, uh, representing an organization called TechSoup, but I'm also speaking uh, for a, a, a collaboration of organizations 
Catalyst 2030 being one, Epic Africa being another, and, and Adesso, uh, the fourth one, um, where we have come together to talk about the compliance conundrum and really try and, and take this forward again, you know, with a systems and ecosystem view on this, uh, because there's not just one organization or one way that we're going to solve to these problems as, as we're hearing. Um, so I, I just wanted to like reflect a little bit on the word compliance and due diligence and risk. And, and you know, I think they're considered sort of dirty words, honestly, when it comes to this context of locally led development and, and community driven funding. And um, I think that's because generally these processes are really tailored heavily towards the funder and what the funder needs. Um, civil society organizations we know can feel like it is done to them. They're being treated really as kind of as far down the supply chain as it gets, you know, being service implementers and, and, and um, project uh, providers, um, implementing partner, more than being partners in, in a development process or even experts that they are in the process. Um, you know, compliance exists to ensure transparency and accountability and safety. But, you know, the way it's done today really imposes significant burdens on, on organizations. Um, the costs are high, the frameworks are complex, and really indeed it kind of results in stifling innovation and, and, and indeed really diminishing the work of these organizations, making them invisible because they're often considered just too risky too small to fund. Now, I say all of this recognizing also that the, the funder landscape is diverse and progressing and, and, and changing. Um, and many funders, you know, we're hearing today, uh, even with the World Bank, really rethinking really about what is their relationship with civil society? What is their relationship, especially with the, the organizations closest to the communities that they serve? And how can there be a more trust-based relationship and so there's a lot of work that's happening within different types of funding organization, thinking about the application process, the due diligence process, the reporting processes, and looking to streamline that and make that a much more partnership driven um, uh, relationship focused uh, process, which we salute. I mean, that's all important to, to note. I would also say, though, that, you know, civil society organizations, the ones as we've talked to them over you know, multiple years of, of being involved in this work, you know, they they get the need for accountability. And they recognize that it's actually concert, compliance can serve as a quality assurance um, that can build trust, ensuring that, you know, the right me mechanisms and processes are in place can actually help them to attract more substantial funding. So they welcome the the opportunity to develop systems and processes that reflect good practices as well. So I, I just wanted to put that also that I, I, you know, compliance doesn't need to be like something that is always done to civil society. Yet that is how it feels at the moment because the processes are so opaque, discrim discriminatory. And, and I think really we're operating in the context where funders are managing their risk, but they're not taking into account the risk that civil society organizations confront and, and have to deal with. So in a way, it's like a double whammy of discrimination, of disadvantage. So as we know, uh, and Ali has very well, um, they articulately communicated to us, you know, these problems are deeply entrenched, deeply rooted in the funding architecture in which we're all operating. Um, and so, so it's not simple, but I think we have identified some areas where we would like to see some progress and we think we're, we're ready to take some steps. And, the, the first one would be around standardizing and streamlining compliance and due diligence processes. Um, so to make compliance more accessible for community driven organizations, they need to be more, uh, they need to be simplified and more proportionate. And so rather than expecting every organization to look like an international NGO, we recommend taking a broader view that takes into account, you know, the risks that organizations face and, and appropriate support to mitigate these risks. So we can standardize and streamline compliance and, and TechSoup has been working on a, a program called STEP that moves away from this kind of pass fail uh, um, type of due diligence to really be more nuanced and more supportive of diverse organizational types. And then connected to that, once we've streamlined that, that process, really thinking about sharing due diligence. And I think this is for me, one of the most important things because each funder today really conducts their own due diligence inquiries. 
Um, and that just results in so much duplication, so much friction. And particularly for small organizations who don't have their own compliance teams, or even a compliance person, you know, it puts so much burden on the leadership of those organizations, really takes them away from you know, the, the, the focus of the, their organizations, the mission of their organizations. Um, and then the final piece, so sharing reports, due diligence reports, um, passporting, you know, multiple mechanisms that we're exploring. But the other piece of that, which I think is really important, is giving the organizations themselves that report, access to their data, essentially. Um, and again, that's what we do with the STEP program. So it reduces this sense that due diligence is extractive and opaque. And it's really giving them something that they can build upon also. Um, and so, you know, really taking it away uh, from this feeling also that it should be a one-off exercise. So my third point, there's just two more, um, is uh, capabilities development. So rather than it being a one-off um, exercise to process a grant, really thinking about the capabilities and partnership with the community organization to foster stronger, more sustainable entities. Um, and again, if we think about this ecosystems approach, there are so many organizations working so much so closely um, in the context of civil society, understanding their operating context, who provide this kind of support and are ready and willing to do that. So how can we bring them in so that expertise is really harnessed? Um, and then, you know, I, I have to say it also, you know, flexible, unrestricted multi-year funding is also critical to help these organizations really plot their own timeline, right? And think about what they want and how they want to develop themselves as organizations. And so the final point- Can I ask you to, yeah. Can I ask you to close Sorry, down, we yeah. have to break up. Okay, well, I, I, I think it's it's well stated maybe already, but the, the, the idea of these partnerships that we're building, um, there's, as I say, no one organization can do it alone. And so, you know, I think really doing that and thinking about that way was putting the CSOs at the heart of what we do is, is, is you know, really, I think our guiding light on this. And um, I will hand back over. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think what you're doing is brilliant and much more organizational explorations need to go in this direction. And sharing risks, creating legacies, exploring long-term engagements are all part of the value systems that we have to bring in. Uh, Mishi, how are we going to develop the groups? We are 47 people. I have assigned everybody to a group. And there is also somebody from Ali's team in each of the groups. Um, and they will be taking notes and also supporting with facilitating slightly. But the idea is that everybody talks about um, common themes, challenges, questions, um, and it's a more free-flowing discussions. I'm ready to launch the rooms if it's okay with you, Sheila. Uh, and just one minute. I think you should ask them to identify a facilitator. If you haven't already nominated one. So we so have one. Person... gets a chance. Yeah, we have one. So the note taker is also the facilitator. Yes. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Super. Okay, I'm opening the rooms. If there are any issues, I'm in the main room. Move to the last session. Let's let's move to the last session. Super. So we we are on the last four minutes of the session. The idea to close was to talk about, um, and I'm saying this on behalf of Jeru, uh, talk about next steps and the concrete action plan. Um, so I think one thing that we are definitely going to do is consolidate everything that people have said and send an official. A letter or a note to Ali and the rest of his team with everything that we've picked up from this session. Um, that's the one concrete step that I will be working on and I will keep everybody that's in this group posted um, and continue to keep everybody involved. Um, are there any other next steps, Ali, that you think, Sheila, you think we should do? I think we have to keep this conversation going with the same honesty, integrity, and commitment that we see so strongly in this conversation today. The volume of potential partners for this facility is huge. Mm -hmm. 
yet it has to be very special and different to create a new pathway for a partnership model that learns, aggregates, demonstrates, and transforms. So Ali and his team have all of us strongly support this new way of working. And I think that we see this process as one that all of us at Catalyst want to embrace, not only in terms of the resources, but also of the learning of new ways of transacting resources of sharing risks, of sharing knowledge, and for scaling up this process. So I think if you have a few last words, Ali, we could then close. Sheila, I think it's an inspirational framing and it's one that I'd pick on dir up directly. I think there are a few moments in time that give opportunity that that's quite unique. And I think right now, while there's a lot about climate, I think it branches out to a lot of, you know, everything else the world is dealing with. Um, you know, from the traditional sustainable development challenges to, you know, um, the whole spectrum of issues we, we need to support. And I think one of the challenges in these broader discussions is that there's very little presence of, of the views coming out of these networks. We lived in these walled gardens. And when I'm sitting in these larger conversations, honestly, this piece of work is seen as boutique on the side. It's not part of the bigger solution often. And then in your world, maybe some of the things these large institutions like the World Bank uh, and these other global financing mechanisms are doing are also not being discussed. We're going to see the largest scale up in finance flowing to developing countries in emerging markets, perhaps since the creation of the Bretton Woods institutions after World War II. It's going to be used to catalyze even larger volumes of private funding to solve what's an existential challenge to the world. But that existential challenge also goes to the other challenges that allow to have livable, sustainable societies, communities, countries. So I think the plea we're making is that we can't forget the social sector, that the private and public sectors alone will not get to the goals we want to achieve. And money matters. The money isn't the only thing. This isn't about just pushing out now resources. It's what Sheila said. It's bringing sets of ideas that need to come together if we're going to solve some of the world's most intractable problems. And I think your sector too, I'd like to say our sector, because I've been involved in it from, from, from a very different perspective, but this is what I've worked in uh, on you know, my 20 years working in this space, has also matured to a level where there are real scalable solutions. I was struck by the Gunj discussion I was also with Anshu and, um, and Bellagio. Mm -hmm. A lot of these solutions are, are now scalable. They can be part of the big financing. Maybe that wasn't the case 20, 30 years ago when Development Marketplace was started, for example. So now's really a chance to bring these ecosystems and worlds together. The plea to all of you is while there's resistance on the big institution side, perhaps as well, there's also resistance on the other side, which is often scared of this big space. But these worlds need to come together to drive the change we all believe in. So, so that's my plea to all of you. Let's try to break down the, the, the wall separating these gardens. They're both beautiful gardens in their own way, but if we don't do it, we're not going to get to the goals we all want to reach. So, so thanks to, to all of you, and, and I really look forward to collaborating with, with all of you going forward. Thank you so much, Ali, and thank you, your team, for spending time with us and all the networks we do. And Mishri, thank you for guiding us through this process, and all of you who have participated. Let's let's meet together with some celebrations of a way forward. Best of luck to all of us. Thank you, Ali. Thank Ali. you. Thank you. See you in the main session. Bye. 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 <laughs>